Chapter Ten of Agnes Gray by Anne Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. The Church. Well, Miss Gray, what do you think of the new curate? asked Miss Murray on our return from church the Sunday after the recommencement of our duties. I can scarcely tell, was my reply. I have not even heard him preach. Well, but you saw him, didn't you? yes but i cannot pretend to judge of a man's character by a single cursory glance at his face but isn't he ugly he did not strike me as being particularly so i don't dislike that cast of countenance but the only thing i particularly noticed about him was his style of reading which appeared to me good infinitely better at least than mr hatfield's he read the lessons as if he were bent on giving full effect to every passage it seemed as if the most careless person could not have helped attending nor the most ignorant to fail to understand and the prayers he read as if he were not reading at all but praying earnestly and sincerely from his own heart oh yes that's all he's good for he can plod through the service well enough but he has not a single idea beyond it how do you know oh i know perfectly well i am an excellent judge in such matters did you see how he went out of church, stumping along as if there were nobody there but himself, never looking to the right hand or the left, and evidently thinking of nothing but just getting out of the church, and perhaps home to his dinner? His great stupid head could contain no other idea. "'I suppose you would have had him cast a glance into the squire's pew,' said I, laughing at the vehemence of her hostility. "'Indeed!' i should have been highly indignant if he had dared to do such a thing replied she haughtily tossing her head then after a moment's reflection she added well well i suppose he's good enough for his place but i'm not dependent on him for amusement that's all did you see how mr hatfield hurried out to get a bow from me and be in time to put us into the carriage yes i answered internally adding and i thought it somewhat derogatory to his dignity as a clergyman to come flying from the pulpit in such eager haste to shake hands with the squire and hand his wife and daughters into their carriage and moreover i owe him a grudge for nearly shutting me out of it for in fact though i was standing before his face close beside the carriage steps waiting to get in he would persist in putting them up and closing the door till one of the family stopped him by calling out that the governess was not in yet then without a word of apology he departed wishing them good morning and leaving the footman to finish the business nota bene mr hatfield never spoke to me neither did sir hugh or lady meltham nor mr harry nor miss meltham nor mr green or his sisters nor any other lady or gentleman who frequented that church nor in fact any one who visited at horton lodge miss murray ordered the carriage again in the afternoon for herself and her sister she said it was too cold for them to enjoy themselves in the garden and besides she believed harry melton would be at church for she said smiling slyly at her own fair image in the glass he has been a most exemplary attendant at church these last few sundays you would think he was quite a good christian and you may go with us miss gray i want you to see him he is so greatly improved since he returned from abroad you can't think and besides then you will have an opportunity of seeing the beautiful mr weston again and of hearing him preach i did hear him preach and was decidedly pleased with the evangelical truth of his doctrine as well as the earnest simplicity of his manner and the clearness and force of his style it was truly refreshing to hear such a sermon after being so long accustomed to the dry prosy discourses of the former curate and the still less edifying harangues of the rector mr hatfield would come sailing up the aisle or rather sweeping along like a whirlwind with his rich silk gown flying behind him and rustling against the pew doors mount the pulpit like a conqueror ascending his triumphal car then sinking on to the velvet cushion in an attitude of studied grace remain in silent prostration for a certain time then mutter over or collect and gabble through the lord's prayer rise draw off one bright lavender glove 
to give the congregation the benefit of his sparkling rings, lightly pass his fingers through his well-curled hair, flourish a cambric handkerchief, recite a very short passage, or perhaps a mere phrase of scripture, as a headpiece to his discourse, and finally deliver a composition which, as a composition, might be considered good, though far too studied and too artificial to be pleasing to me. The propositions were well laid down, the arguments logically conducted, and yet it was sometimes hard to listen quietly throughout, without some slight demonstrations of disapproval or impatience. His favorite subjects were church discipline, rites and ceremonies, apostolical succession, the duty of reverence and obedience to the clergy, the atrocious criminality of dissent, the absolute necessity of observing all forms of godliness, the reprehensible presumption of individuals who attempted to think for themselves in matters connected with religion, or to be guided by their own interpretations of scripture, and occasionally to praise his wealthy parishioners, the necessity of deferential obedience from the poor to the rich, supporting his maxims and exhortation throughout with quotations from the fathers, with whom he appeared to be far better acquainted than with the apostles and evangelists, and whose importance he seemed to consider at least equal to theirs. But now and then he gave us a sermon of a different order, what some would call a very good one, but sunless and severe, representing the deity as a terrible taskmaster rather than a benevolent father. Yet as I listened, I felt inclined to think the man was sincere in all he said, he must have changed his views and become decidedly religious, gloomy and austere, yet still devout. But such illusions were usually dissipated on coming out of the church, by hearing his voice in joke and colloquy with some of the Meltons or Greens, or perhaps the Murrays themselves, probably laughing at his own sermon, and hoping that he had given the rascally people something to think about perhaps exulting in the thought that old Betty Holmes would now lay aside the sinful indulgence of her pipe, which had been her daily solace for upward of thirty years, that George Higgins would be frightened out of his Sabbath evening walks, that Thomas Jackson would be sorely troubled in his conscience, and shaken in his sure and certain hope of a joyful resurrection at the last day. Thus I could not but conclude that Mr. Hatfield was one of those who bind heavy burdens, and grievous to be borne, and lay them upon men's shoulders, while they themselves would not move them with one of their fingers, and who make the word of God of none effect by their traditions, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. I was well pleased to observe that the new curate resembled him, as far as I could see, in none of these particulars. "'Well, Miss Gray, what do you think of him now?' said Miss Murray, as we took our places in the carriage after service. "'No harm still,' replied I. "'No harm?' repeated she in amazement. "'What do you mean?' "'I mean I think no worse of him than I did before.' "'No worse? I should think not indeed, quite the contrary. Is he not greatly improved?' "'Oh, yes, very much indeed.' replied i for i had now discovered that it was henry meltham she meant not mr weston that gentleman had eagerly come forward to speak to the young ladies a thing he would hardly have ventured to do had their mother been present he had likewise politely handed them into the carriage he had not attempted to shut me out like mr hatfield neither of course had he offered me his assistance i should not have accepted it if he had but as long as the door remained open he had stood smirking and chatting with them and then lifted his hat and departed to his own abode but i had scarcely noticed him all that time my companions however had been more observant and as we rolled along they discussed between them not only his looks words and actions but every feature of his face and every article of his apparel you shan't have him all to yourself rosalie said miss matilda at the close of the discussion i like him i know he'd make a nice jolly companion for me well you're quite welcome to him matilda replied her sister in a tone of affected indifference and i'm sure continued the other he admires me quite as much as he does you doesn't he miss gray i don't know i'm not acquainted with his sentiments 
well but he does though my dear matilda nobody will ever admire you till you get rid of your rough awkward manners oh stuff harry meltham likes such manners and so do papa's friends well you may captivate old men and younger sons but nobody else i am sure will ever take a fancy to you i don't care i'm not always grabbing after money like you and mamma if my husband is able to keep a few good horses and dogs i shall be quite satisfied and the rest may go to the devil well if you use such shocking expressions i'm sure no real gentleman will ever venture to come near you really miss gray you should not let her do so i can't possibly prevent it miss murray and you're quite mistaken matilda in supposing that harry meltham admires you i assure you he does nothing of the kind matilda was beginning an angry reply but happily our journey was now at an end and the contention was cut short by the footman opening the carriage door and letting down the steps for our descent End of chapter ten